Good morning, this is Robert Stoffel. Checking in by phone with our HealthSeek meeting for February 18th, 2020, and I'd like to go ahead and call the meeting to order. Am I supposed to say a meeting is called to order? Okay, Robert, uh, so do you want to do the roll or do you want me to? Oh, well, yeah, we can go ahead and um, do the roll. Um, who do we have representing uh, Northern Planning Area? Make sure, you, make sure your microphones are on, please. Okay, hearing none, how about Council Bay? And Weedy Hannibal. Oops. So, Robert, hey, we have Mike Weedy. and Weedy. Uh, is Mike, Mike Grant there? Yes, I am. Okay, great. All right, King, super, thanks. So, uh, who do we have from Capital Bay? Brent Fenster is present, uh, representing Capitol Bay Planning Area. Andy Smith is unable to be here today. Okay, thank you, Brent. Um, how about for the Central Planning Area? Central Planning Area is Mike Prez, present. Uh, Dave Shurick will not be able to attend today. Okay, Mike, thank you so much. And Southern Planning Area? Uh, representing Southern Planning Area is Derek and Tim. From Riverside. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much. Anyone else that we need to recognize? If we want to do a roll call of anybody on the phone. I think you're the only one on. We're checking now. And I think we can move on to item two. Brent Fenster, I make a motion to approve the minutes of the November 18th, 2019 meeting. Derek already second the motion. Okay, for the minutes, we have a motion and a second. Any uh, discussion? I see none okay, of them. Okay, all in favor of approving? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, minutes are approved. And we can move to the next item. Okay, this is a planning area brief out, it's northern planning area. The northern planning area is concluding our efforts to write three regional TICPs, and this is a conclusion of two years of work. We've had participation from six, 17 out of the 18 operating areas, so we thought that the um, participation level was high and we're in what they consider to be a final review. Although at, even at this late date, we're getting some requests from some of the um, OAs that they have more to add. So at some point we need to put a stop to it. One of the benefits to getting these regional plans is it, it, got us an it gave us an opportunity to sit down and talk as several OAs together in how we would um, interoperate in emergencies. So was, I thought it was a, it was a worthwhile effort. Um, it was a lot of work, but uh, I felt it was worthwhile and, and we feel relatively con confident now with the regional TICPs that are coming out. Um, we expect that they'll be finalized within the next, I would say within the next 60 days. And um, one additional thing ICT, ICTAP has been able to accomplish for us is they gained approval to actually load everything into CHASM. Now, I know that there's some question with whether CHASM is the right tool 
but at the same time we wanted it in some online fashion that we could eventually be able to update. But I, I think chasm is something that as a group here we probably need to address at some point. Mike? I'd just like to add on about the <clears throat> all of us working together on this. We spent two days. We had actually scheduled it for three, but all the right people came together. We got it done in two days. The second day, there was a tremendous amount of discussion between all the agencies and even the different regions how we had split up the regional TICP plan. Um, and it was extremely helpful for everybody to be involved in that conversation, a whole lot better than what we did in the past, creating our own TICPs kind of in a silo or having someone do them for us, but all individually and not taking into consideration our partners. So that, that worked out really well. Thank you very much. Uh, we're gonna move on to Capitol Bay planning area. Brent. Thank you. Uh, I do not have much to report, unfortunately. We were going to have a meeting the uh, first quarter, actually the first month or so of 2020, and um, had some scheduling conflicts and some problems with that. Um, so we don't have a meeting. We have not had a meeting since uh, the last CalSeq meeting. Um, it's my intention to uh, work with our chair and with Cal OES to do some strategic planning in the next 30 days about Capitol Bay and see what we can do to uh, institute some uh, or refresh our energy level and look for some, uh, some more people to, uh, to really be some, um, some of our, our stakeholders from various agencies that really are, can be committed to participating with uh, the planning area and start working on a, um, a plan of action for the next 12 to 24 months and uh, really see if we can't uh, put something together. Um, what uh, happens in the northern planning area is has been outstanding and, and every quarter the report is always, you know, a lot of activity and a lot of uh, of, of real good collaboration that's going on there. And there's some things in the southern planning area, especially as it relates to the uh, radio, rodeo, I believe you call it, um, that we need to, to look at and see if we can't replicate in the Capitol Bay planning area. So over the next uh, 30 days, um, I, uh, I really hope that we can do some strategic planning and, and come up with something for the future. Great, thank you, Brent. Moving to the central planning area. Oh, go ahead, Robert. I, I heard most of that. It's, the connection isn't greatest, but I think anything that you guys come up with that you think might be valuable with sharing with the other planning areas would be uh, wonderful if you could share that because I, I think some of us are kind of in that stalled mode right now where there's not a lot going on and maybe a, re a little revitalization might be good. So anything you guys learn that you think others could benefit, please do share. I'd appreciate that. Well, you know, Brent, this is Weedy from the Northern Planning Area. I think in the North, um, we just have, it's Mike and myself, and we've got a couple of people in some of the operational areas, like Lisa up at Cal in um, Tehama County. And we just really work at reaching out. And it takes a lot of effort. And so I certainly understand the position you're in. Um, my concern is if and when um, Mike and I take our leave, my concern is for the future. And so we're trying really hard to raise up people even behind us. I can't imagine the position that you're in where you're just trying to raise up those two or three individuals that are going to spearhead this for you because that's what it takes, I think. At least that's what it's taken in the North. Thanks, Weedy. Um, I certainly agree with that. In fact, there's a rumbling and we've already discussed it informally here this morning how the need for succession planning on all levels at the agency as well as um, you know, CalSeq and in the planning areas is so essential to bring up um, the younger generations and to get them involved and participants in 
in this and excited about what it, um, the future could bring if we work on things, you know, in a cooperative, collaborative of manner. But we really need to get those people educated and, and uh, mentor them. Robert, did you have anything else for Cap Bay, for Brent? No, other than what these comments, I think, are certainly applicable across the board for all of us. Okay, so next we're going to go to the central planning area. Clay? I'm sorry, Mike. <clears throat> Mike Perez from the central planning area. Um, not a whole lot to... Uh, <clears throat> um, to report on, um, we are work, just working on hardening our interoperability using um, XMD west and east. Um, we just had a violent incident uh, training drill where we had uh, over 100 participants and um, um, also had 18 different agencies there, and we used XMD um, east, and it actually went very well. So getting the different agencies to be able to communicate on the channel was good. Um, we do have an RFP out. For building a third radio tower so we're waiting to uh, get the RFPs back on that so we can move forward um, using the grant money to um, get that third radio tower built to upgrade our comms and we have our local meeting that's actually going on right now so I have someone else sitting in that and here I am so <laughs> nothing to report on uh, that meeting that's happening actually this afternoon so um, that's it for central Air planning into report Thank you, Mike. Robert, did you have anything for Mike? Uh, no, thank you for being there. And I go to Southern Planning Area. All right, thank you. Uh, this is Derek Gard. We had our uh, first quarter meeting on January 7th. Uh, we discussed the radio rodeo, which we have tentatively scheduled for uh, November 10th. Uh, we also are working on a discussion to combine that with our COMEX, and I have a meeting with John Hudson and Chad Stokes, uh, I believe it's this week, to discuss the logistics of that. San Marcos Fire is offering to uh, host a site for that. We're trying to find something more centralized in the Southern Plan area so we can get more people involved in it and have a regional type of event. Uh, uh, Robert also was out. I got a report that Robert met with Glendale, and they are looking at, um, they're interested in participating with us also. So that could be a possible second uh, location. We also put out the, um, the matrix that I had submitted to a couple uh, CalSeq meetings ago for the southern planning area. And everybody's approved our interoperability uh, plan with that. So now we're looking this year to schedule regular testing so that we test and make sure that our plan actually works when we need it. Um, you know, a, a helpful, <laughs> helpful idea. <laughs> and uh, we also have, um, we're getting, I'm getting some input from um, uh, L.A. County Fire on some of the ways that they do it because they have a really neat, um, app that has all the same information that I have on my matrix where it shares everybody's radio, what channels are in what radio zone so everybody knows so you can help each other out when they come into your area. And they actually have an app that does that, which is kind of cool. And uh, that is, our next meeting is in April, and that's where we're at. Thank you, Derek. Robert? I'm there in person. Sorry, say that again. I, I was just wondering if Tim there in person. Yeah, I'm here in person. Okay. So for our slide, we'll have to get that up. It's, we um, actually have to do two new, uh, a new chair and a new vice chair. So excited to see some new blood in there. There's nothing else on the planning area updates, and since you have quite a few of the next few items on the agenda, do you just want to take them one by one? 
Sure, that'd be great. Thank you, Robert. Okay, thanks. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to brief out on is the Cal EFOG. Um, we're basically uh, at the conclusion, making the last adjustments to the completed IFOG, and we expect we'll be handing that over to the app developers hopefully later this week. Although we fully anticipated this portion of the project being completed by now due to circumstances outside of anyone's control, like sicknesses, uh, we are hoping that we'll have it at, uh, to the app developer by the end of the week if not very shortly. And then we anticipate the app being developed uh, around mid-May. It takes about two months for the app developers to uh, take the information we provide them and develop the app. So we're at the final stages, uh, sta stages of that project. LJ Nielsen and our broadband services has been doing a great job making sure we're producing an accurate application prior to development. So this will reduce the amount of time we need to spend making updates after the app is deployed. And we can focus on specifically uh, you know, necessary updates as we move forward. Any questions on the Cal EFOG? All right, the next item I'm going to move to is the uh, 2020 TA requests. We're allowed to have, I believe, five. Gets confusing when we're given a lot more than we're allowed. So, <laughs> Um, we have a numerous TA requests approved for this year. The first one is the SKIP workshop. The SKIP, as everybody knows, is a stakeholder-driven, multi-jurisdictional, multidisciplinary, strategic statewide plan to enhance interoperable emergency communications. The SKIP is a critical mid-range, three to five year strategic planning tool. And we've elected to do it at the early stages of the three to five year window. Uh, with the new developments in technology and operating systems that are out there, we feel it will gain more benefit if we try to stay ahead of the curve. If we waited till five years, there'd be too much to uh, catch up on. So that's scheduled for the May to July timeframe of this year. And as of now, budget is still the point of contact, subject to change. The next one is our COMEX uh, that was approved. The one that's listed here is uh, for the Cap Bay planning area. And with the courses that are being offered, uh, we've identified the need for more opportunities for position task book sign-offs. So we're trying to add enough exercise and opportunities for people to get their task book signed off. This is just another one of those. And it's tentatively scheduled for June. So just to recap how the TAs go, once we get the approved request, we have a scoping call. And uh, so to to date, I don't believe we've had the scoping call for this one yet, but it, so it is tentatively scheduled for June. The next one we have is the incident tactical dispatcher. We tried to schedule that last year, and it's a challenge for many reasons. One of them is dispatchers are uh, typically understaffed, so getting them to get released from duty for a full week course is a challenge. We put that later in the year during fire season, it's an even greater challenge. So this year we've tried to schedule it earlier on and we're going to try and get creative and possibly send out a survey to the uh, planning areas to see what uh, time frame throughout the year will work best. So we can try and get this course done. Uh, it's a very important course. Uh, it's very important to have dispatchers during incidents. So. The sooner we can get more people qualified, the better. The next one is a full-scale exercise. As Derek mentioned, uh, they have a comic scheduled for the southern planning area. The full-scale exercise was also supposed to be integrated with the radio rodeo in November. And as he mentioned, we're going to have a coordination call shortly. Another great opportunity for a position task book, but also we haven't exercised uh, interoperability communications in San Diego in quite a while. So we definitely want to get down there and uh, share the love. The incident communications manager, uh, that one is to be determined as well for a date. Uh, I don't believe we've had a scoping call on that one yet either. Oxcom is going to be in the northern planning area in March tentatively, but without having a, had a scoping call for that one, I don't believe we had the scoping call yet. So our time frame may be, uh, may have to be pushed back, but 
We're going to work with our uh, Homeland Security partners to get these scope and calls completed soon. I have a question on that. Yes. Brent Fenster, uh, Capitol Bay. Um, I'm wondering, was this something that was uh, implemented or, or initiated by the northern planning area, um, or was this something that you assigned to the northern planning area? The reason why I ask is um, it seems like because we had so many issues with the incident dispatcher training and um, stops and starts on that because of uh, inability to fill the class. Um, I was thinking if that was closer to the Sacramento area, we might be able to draw a more central um, point and, and sort of a hub of, of people to attend that. And uh, there's been some interest, I know, from other places um, than just the northern. Uh, so you're speaking part. specifically about the Oxcom course? That's correct. So the courses that were selected were after uh, solicitation for input from the planning areas and whatever opportunities still existed based on their responses, we've selected some courses to fill those gaps so that we didn't miss out on any of these opportunities. So uh, Mike, did you want to speak to where you may hold it? So what was last year, year before last, there was the one in um, Fairfield, an Oxcom class that was down here. And I think the decision was to push a little further north because people came up with the exact argument, opposite argument you had, Brent, is to, was too far away for them. So um, we haven't had, I don't know that you have, I don't believe either one of us have had a lot of people asking for it specifically, but there was a lot of interest when that other class was given and they weren't able to attend, so. And, and I think in addition to that, this is Weedy, um, during the campfire, there was quite a bit of confusion. And so there's been a, a multiple meetings um, with some of our aux auxiliary units. And so to clear some of the confusion, uh, Mike Beckstrand was, had attended some of those meetings. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's probably the genesis of this particular uh, request. Okay. So if there is uh, additional interest in having an OXCOM somewhere else in the state, we are uh, able to submit a, another request and see if Homeland Security is able to support it or not. So if you do have a need and you can almost guarantee attendance, we can definitely put that forth. Yeah, I, I really don't have a, like a list of names or anything, but the one thing I would like to recommend to the Northern Planning Area is to try to push it on the southern part of your area as opposed to putting it in Reading or something like that. Yeah, we understand that. Unfortunately, what that does for us is it limits our participation of the the um, OAs that are close to the Oregon border, because as it is just to come to our meetings, which are in Tehama and Butte, um, some of our representatives have to come the night before and spend the night, and they're not getting reimbursed for it. So their agencies have to be willing to do that. So we try to spread the love, Hank, to lots of our areas. But I certainly hear you, Brent. I think the more that we can consolidate and work together, the better. Um, in this particular case, maybe that's something that we can do. You know, I'll, I'll do a little bit of work and reach out and find out how many people will be coming to this and kind of take a look at where they're in, in where they'd be coming from and see if there's some way that we can also accommodate your request or at least get closer. <laughs> Thanks, Brent. Thanks, Weedy. So the next slide, I think, is the... Uh, 2019 TA requests. We're keeping these on for tracking purposes. As you can see, the first one there is the IFOG, and uh, we were a little aggressive in our projection that it would have already been sent to DHS for conversion. So, as I mentioned earlier, hopefully this week. The next uh, slide shows the COMT course. This is an additional course that we were allotted outside of our request. That's going to be hosted in the southern planning area. Uh, Santa Maria, I believe, is hosting the COMT course. It's going to be May 18th through the 22nd. And that completes the TA request. Robert, did you have anything before I move on to item six? 
Okay, prior to this meeting, we've sent everybody, hopefully you all had a, received a copy of the communication unit position credentialing document. Um, as you can see on the slide, this has been in the works for a while now. Uh, and I think we're at the point, Robert, where we're going to vote uh, to make that document and the working group approved. That sounds good. Did, did anybody there have any comments about or concerns about the document before we uh, do the vote? Brent Fenster, I have a question for probably directed towards Hank. Um, I am supportive of uh, the large change that was made in terms of adding a Cal OES um, that um, G606 course. Um, I'm concerned though because I went online on the Cal OES website to find out what the availability was and over the course of the next six months, as of a couple of days ago, there are no scheduled classes and there's no information on it being like an online course. So I don't want that to become a barrier to students because they can't get that course in a readily available manner. So I had the same challenge when I went to sign up and take the course. And it is also, it's, it's identified on the website as being an in-person course, but it is equally available online. It's a four-hour course. Um, we can provide more specifics on how to get to the online portion, uh, but it is available that way. So, And that's what we anticipate everybody, because I don't even know if they actually uh, hold the in-person course. So I think it's an online only offering at this point. Yeah, if, if you log in through CSTI, open an account there, you can take the course. It's actually about, I think it took me about two hours to do it. So I'll make sure we clarify specifically how to get to the online portion. If there's no other questions or concerns, I think you can go ahead and call for a vote. Okay. So do we need a vote, motion for a vote? A motion we take a vote. Do we have a second? Okay. So we have Derek making a motion and Mike Grant seconding. All in favor of adopting the communication unit position credentialing work group? Is that AI? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Hearing none, the motion is passed unanimously. Okay, Robert, uh, we're going to move on to item number seven, unless you had anything else to add. Um, nope, that sounds good. Actually, yes. Brent Finster, quick question. What are the next steps for um, the communications credentialing process? So now that we've approved the document, I would anticipate that the next step would be for the working group to actually meet to work out the logistics of uh, how the process is going to flow from this point forward, especially you know, the fact that we don't need to be in person to approve. We're doing an online approval process just to make sure everybody's familiar with the, the workings of the working group. And then we'll advertise that uh, it's an option and we're open to people submitting their uh, uh, documents for approval. So. The, first, the next steps, I think, would be getting familiar with how the uh, logistics of uh, managing that work group will go and then broadcasting it that it's operational. Who's going to be the point of contact in Cal OES? I'd have to refer to the document. I will get back to you with a confirmation of who that will be. Thank you. All right, so item number seven, uh, we're going to discuss the statewide alert and warning, next gen 911, Chris and CapsNet, all at the same time. Just kidding. So uh, we're going to take this a little bit at a time, a uh, little one step at a time. The statewide alert and warning uh, is part of the next gen 911 contract. Um, I think you may have seen most of these uh, slides before. 
So as far as updates go, uh, Atos, the statewide contractor for Next Gen 911, has elected to go with Everbridge for the statewide alert and warning. We've been doing extensive outreach through MARAC meetings and other venues to educate all the locals on what to expect uh, when alert and warning um, is provided by Everbridge. There's a lot of concern that uh, people will lose funding for their existing uh, systems if they're currently using grant funding. And as of this point in time, there is no anticipation, although it may be logical at a future time, there is nothing current stating that they will lose that funding. Um, we are gathering all the comments on the uh, challenges with integrating Everbridge and moving accounts over. So as anybody's aware of more challenges, send them our way so we can solve them as soon as possible. Um, all right, so I will update on the next gen 911. We have our 2019 call data that came in. Uh, we had 27,361,673 total calls. 82% of those were wireless. 5% were voice over IP and 30, just shy of 35,000 were other telematics. We had 62,321 texts to 911, and that was up from 28,000 the year prior. The PSAP surveys for the next gen 911 project have been completed in the southern, central, and LA planning areas, or project areas, in the north, is projected for a February completion date. So they're moving well on that project. Uh, text to 91 is being developed currently, but there will be no action taken until next gen 91 is actually deployed, and it has a January 2021 uh, completion requirement. So as soon as next gen 91 is deployed, then the text to 91 uh, integration will commence. The 911 advisory board is happening tomorrow, so if anybody has uh, any more questions or inform wants in more information on these projects, feel free to attend the 911 advisory board being held here tomorrow. So the next slide, I believe, goes over the Chris. Should be slide 19, I believe. I'll speak to it. Um, we have a five-year roadmap. A quick update on Chris is the build-out has com uh, completed just north of Sacramento down to the middle of the grapevine. Coverage tests have been run, and the system seems to be operating extremely well. There are no operational communications on it at this time, but the build-out continues. Um, and there is a map in here on slide 21. That kind of looks like that. And this... This map is showing you the stages of uh, build-out for the CRIS project. As you can see, uh, number one is the Central Valley that I mentioned is already tested. Uh, and from there, they're moving to the North Valley. So as that build-out gets completed, we get more um, interest. We'll be reaching out to <coughs> other radio system providers to look at uh, potential integration solutions. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Item number eight. So at the Southwest Border Communications Working Group that we held, they are looking for a pilot project to do an integration with other radio systems. They'd like to stick stay along the southern border, uh, but it doesn't have to be along the southern border. If anybody has some shovel-ready projects for uh, mainly doing interoperable talk groups 
or interfacing two trunking systems. Uh, there is funding, grant funding available for these projects as well. Um, it was released recently announced uh, as we project with Customs and Border Protection. So along these lines also the interoperability talk groups. Um, we discussed that at length. Um, and this is actually the wrong update on the wrong slide. That's my fault. So we have some good ideas of how we're going to structure the interoperability talk groups throughout the state. So we'll be uh, maybe proposing a working group for that uh, process as well, where we can work with other partners across the state. Uh, at one of the recent MARAC meetings, uh, it was addressed that some of the operational areas had deficient radio systems. So we capitalized on that opportunity and sent out a statewide health assessment survey to not only gather the information on uh, what radio systems may be uh, deficient, where Cal OES may be able to assist in identifying grant funding to get their radio systems operational. We also asked them to provide information on what radio systems or projects they had that we could integrate with the CRIS. So as we gather all of those inputs back and, and put them in a table, we'll know who we should or who we can partner with uh, to develop these IP talk groups and the uh, interfaces to other trunking systems. So hopefully you've all seen the survey. Uh, it was sent out late last week or uh, some of the areas were sent out early this yesterday on the holiday. Um, it's basically a quick uh, five question survey asking what systems you currently have, asking what projects you have and what the gaps you're having either to interoperability or operability. So if you haven't seen that, please let me know. And we've asked that the responses come back uh, by this Friday. So. Now this slide 22 is showing you the update of the CAPSNET project, the different phases of the project. I don't really have a whole lot to add to that. So any questions on item number eight, or seven for that matter, sorry. All right, moving on to item number nine. This is the interoperability continuum that you see on the um, wall behind me. And this is what uh, the state is being uh, measured on for our interoperability uh, success, I guess you could, or grade, um, as we make developments and progress towards interoperability. So one of the things that uh, we would, I would suggest that we're looking forward to doing is finding out how to take this interoperability continuum that they're measuring the state on and breaking it down into the operational areas so that we can get a uh, better assessment of where the state is. So when they do the assessment of the state, we holistically looked at the state systems. We didn't look at the region or operational area systems. And I think that would be beneficial for us to do so we can get a better assessment of the state as a whole, not just state systems, but the state interoperability. So if we look at, uh, this is a continuum. Next slide, please. This is the, uh, California assessment. So if you look, you can see where we ranked, uh, what our assessment was for our uh, either initial, define, or optimized. Op our, our ultimate goal is to be optimized in every area. So we'll be sending this out. Um, we plan to do an update and provide an update back to Homeland Security in July of this year. So prior to that, we'll be uh, coordinating with you to try and provide a a uh, more accurate assessment of the state for interoperability. Any questions on that one? Um, Hank, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to um, identify that in the northern planning area, we've used this continuum since the very beginning. Okay. And so on all of our, um, every time I do an agenda, this is on the back side. We don't do as good a job of socializing it at every meeting. 
but it has been a really good tool for us to identify where we are and where our gaps are. So because the state is elevating it again, I think it's wise for us to go back and have this discussion at the next meeting and um, probably reach out to everybody to have them take a serious look at where they are. Because there's been a big turnover in the north and people retiring and that kind of thing, so. That would be great. So, yeah. I think all the planning areas could benefit from doing that because as we look towards funding for improvements, uh, this document is um, one of the two that are uh, identified for justifying the funding, the other being the CalSkip. So I think there's a lot of value in keeping the uh, assessment of interoperability ongoing. All right, question item number 10. So broadband services in California, as you can see from the slide, the build out continues. Um, we're continuing to receive requests from FirstNet for site uh, modifications for build out. We're currently basing our um, build out on tier two and tier three fire threat hazard areas and locations that currently do not have uh, network coverage. slide okay not to read the slides over uh, but I will give an example uh, first net was deployed to Ontario International Airport for our quarantine uh, I'm sorry to March Air Force Base for the quarantine and the initial asset they deployed was uh, band 14 and one other frequency. Um, so they had to deploy a, a different asset that actually addressed the enterprise uh, AT&T network. So there are challenges when you request a deployable, uh, whether your devices are specifically band 14 or not. And if they're not, then you should identify that before you request the asset so they can deploy the right, uh, right deployable for you. Uh, the next slide, the Chico uh, broadband fairground. Broadband at the fairgrounds project was completed, and they're in the final revision of the draft uh, for presentation at a legislative hearing, which is tentatively scheduled for mid-month in March. We had a preliminary executive meeting on Friday to go over their draft report. Um, so it looks promising. There's a lot of valuable information there. And this will help us prioritize, uh, like I mentioned, the build out moving forward. And you see the other note on there. Sprint is also uh, coordinating with us to build their uh, portal for the 19.2 requirements of the CalNet contract. Next slide. So this is your uh, list of broadband service uh, advisors for each planning area. The broadband services unit is fully staffed now. And this will be valuable uh, for you to see under each person that identifies the specific counties for which they have responsibility. As well as their contact info. And Robert, I believe that is the end of my report, pending any questions. Okay, thank you, Hank. Great report. Any questions from anybody? Okay, hearing none, do we have any other uh, discussion items on the next item, on the next agenda item? There are no comments in the room, Robert. Okay. All right. Uh, 
um, our next scheduled meeting is May 19th, I believe. Is that still uh, correct, Hank? Yes, sir. Okay, so let's uh, get that on our calendars. And is there any other action or business we need to discuss before adjourning the meeting? There's nothing in the room. Okay, well, I, I appreciate everyone uh, being there or calling in, and um, thank you again for your support of interoperability. And uh, Hank, unless there's anything further, I think we can uh, conclude the meeting. Thank you, Robert. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. I second. Derek made a motion. Weedy seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. Unanimous decision. We are adjourned. <laughs>